Okay, so we will go live and then we will start. Um, okay, so uh, Paul, you are recording. We are live streaming. I'm in speaker view. Those are the three things I have to check. And I have. Um, And Paul, while I'm making my moderator's remarks, could you take over admitting people, please? And Carlos, you, perhaps you could do that too. I'm going to make you co-host as well. Make co -host. Uh, it, does anybody else need to share slides or anything? No. So Betsy, you you have made you co-host already. So I think we're ready to get go get going now. So let's let's go. So hi, everyone. Welcome to this latest of webinars sponsored by the International Manifesto Group. And this time, this event is also co-organized by Nodu Doll, the People's Forum, the Hampton Institute, and the volumes publisher, the publisher of the volume we are launching in this panel, namely Socialist Education in Korea. Uh, the publisher is Iskra Books. Uh, so our uh, panel is uh, titled Socialist Education in Korea. My name is Radhika Desai. I'm the convener of the International Manifesto Group. Um, uh, socialist Education in Korea, the Politics of, uh, and Pedagogy of Resistance and Revolution is a volume of selected writings by Kim Il-sung on education, and it is edited by Riley sung Yung Park and Cambria York. And today we are joined by the editors and by a few discussants to celebrate the publication of the volume. I'm very happy to introduce this seminar. Um, and I, let me explain why. Socialist education in Korea may seem like an obscure topic. What could possibly be interesting about the pedagogical philosophy of what's generally portrayed in the corporate media as a small socialist country that has cut itself off from the rest of the world in order to preserve what, uh, what is always portrayed as an insane dictatorship, which who brainwashes uh, the people into supporting a cult of a personality and uh, that a small state that threatens the world with nuclear power and is a proverbial economic basket case. Uh, a country which even veteran US scholar of the peninsula who wishes to bring about a lasting peace between his country and the two Koreas seems to describe very disparagingly. He says about uh, uh, the North, he said he has no sympathy with the North, which is the author of most of its own troubles specializes in self-defeating behavior, treats like children the masses of its own population unlucky enough to be excluded from the elite, and indulges in such stereotypical hero worship, grandiose exaggeration, and wretched excess as to make even a scholar of East Asia uh, reach for dusty old tomes with titles like Oriental Despotism. These are the words of Bruce Cummings, who actually wrote a book uh, on North Korea in order to pr promote, uh, he thinks, uh, lasting good relations between the United States and the Koreas. Well, of course, the answer is, you know, what could be interesting about studying the socialist uh, education and pedagogy of this country? The answer is not just a great deal, but I would say the essence of education and pedagogy in the struggle for socialism, which is first and foremost a struggle against imperialism. The fact is that not only is the corporate press wrong, but so are our dominant ways of thinking about pedagogy and education. Uh, uh, and these can be corrected in many ways by many of the essays in this book. In contrast to what Kim Il-sung advocates in the book, in the essays included in the book here, which is a knowledge of national history, national circumstances, the national struggle, and national requirements, the education advocated around the world is cosmopolitan, disdains national histories and conditions. Whereas Kim Il-sung's views seek to bind intellectuals and the people, including by making intellectuals understand the people and the people themselves become intellectuals. One can't help in this instance thinking of Gramsci's view that everyone is an intellectual, only some of us are uh, paid to be that, but that's the only difference. The education the West dispenses separates the educated from the people. Just how it does so is clear from the rise of the so-called populist, but in fact fascist, for proto-fascist right today in some of the advanced countries where the key divide has become education. 
Our education system also forgets Gramsci's argument that reformation was a far greater cultural event than the Renaissance. The Renaissance may have found a few people, a select elite soared to new heights of culture, art, science, literature, and so on. But the Reformation brought vast masses of the people into culture. The insistence of the Reformation that everyone should be able to read the Bible led to the standardization of languages and mass literacy in the Protestant countries, and uh, an event that Gramsci considered of far greater importance. But to me, the real significance of Kim Il-sung's writings on Juche and education lies in its understanding of politics and the making of history. If politics is the most fundamentally creative activity, if politics actually makes history, as I think it does, if it is also an unforgivingly collective act, then socialist education in Korea, education in Juche, is about forcing the agency of the people that will make up the political collectivity, about keeping that people intellectually primed so that it can make the right decisions and be able to take up the continuous challenges that imperialism throws at it. It's interesting in this context to consider this the question whether this focus on education and ideology is not a little idealistic, not a bit. Creating a material force that is conscious of its own history is essentially part, uh, essentially creating the conditions for participating in politics and in history in a historically informed way. To create a force that is capable of conscious, theoretically informed political and revolutionary practice on a grand scale. To, to be capable of an intervention uh, because after all, the Korean Revolution has been a major uh, event of international significance, to create a force that is capable of intervening in what Marx calls the relations of producing nations, in the international relations or the geopolitical economy of the capitalist world, which is also, uh, which also in Marx's words, constituted the grandest terrain on which the contradictions of capital appear, and they appear there in their grandest development. The Korean people are intervening not just in their, his, their own history, but in the larger confrontation between capitalism and nascent actually existing socialisms that have set the world on a path to socialism. I would like to end these introductory remarks on a personal note. Reading these essays as, uh, as someone born and brought up in India and educated until her first degree in India, uh, and who was also fortunate enough to be educated with the textbooks that were written in the 1970s by a brilliant area of India's best intellectuals about the subcontinent's ancient and modern history, its economic problems, its geography and that of the world, not to mention texts written across the natural sciences and mathematics. In the context of a backward capitalism, however, these textbooks could not last. Certainly, after I graduated, they were being uh, replaced by pale imitations or worse. Even so, reading Kim Il-sung's views on education uh, that were essentially a way of making Koreans subjectively aware of the objective historical circumstances in which they acted and the objectively historical and world historical challenges they face, I'm only acutely aware of how much is lacking in education in the imperialized world. These essays should be published and read there too. So we are about to start this wonderful panel. Uh, I've made my introduction. We will now have about, I think, six speakers. We have one of whom unfortunately has had to is traveling and uh, has had to send us a, a recording. But we each of the speakers will speak for about eight to 10 minutes. Um, and I will introduce each of them as we go along. Um, and at the end of that, we will have time for question and answer. Uh, and I will say a little bit more about how we will conduct that when we get there. So let me first introduce uh, the first two speakers that are Nate uh, and Ben. So um, one second, please. Um, oh, sorry, I don't have biographies of Nate and Ben. So maybe if you would please just say a couple of things about yourselves before you start. Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Radhika. That was a beautiful introduction. Uh, so my name is Nate Reed, uh, and I'm here today along with Ben Stonke. Uh, We're from Iskra Books. Uh, so Iskra Books is an independent scholarly publisher. Uh, we specialize in original works of revolutionary theory, uh, practice, and arts. 
Uh, so I'd like to just take a, a quick moment and just thank all the other organizers of the event uh, today. It's the International Manifesto Group, uh, No Do Tall, uh, the People's Forum, and Hampton Institute, uh, and of course all the speakers who are agreeing to be with us today uh, to celebrate the release of this book. Uh, and likewise, we appreciate all the listeners, the watchers, the attendees for joining us today as well. Uh, for what should be a very informative, important, and inter uh, interesting series of short talks on a book we've published, uh, which is again, Socialist Education in Korea, Selected Works of Kim Il-sung. Uh, that was edited and introduced by two of our esteemed speakers today, uh, Riley Sung Yoon Park and Cambria York. So we also, uh, as Radica mentioned, hope that we can kind of hit on socialist education in a more general sense in the real world, uh, its relevance to us today as revolutionary organizers. Uh, so we know this lineup of speakers will have some uh, really engaging material to share with us today. And, and again, we're, we're very happy to participate. Uh, just as a quick note uh, on our perspective as a publisher, uh, we're incredibly proud of uh, publishing socialist education in Korea uh, for a, a whole number of reasons. But one of the major ones, and Radhika hit on this, is, is the timeliness of the book. Uh, and it's a little odd to say that considering it's a collection of old texts for the most part uh, from Kim Il-sung. But uh, just because the text was written in the past doesn't mean it's not relevant for today, right? So as educators, researchers, activists, uh, organizers in the revolutionary movement, uh, we know there's a profound need for an anti-imperialist and anti-colonial uh, pedagogy that's grounded really firmly in revolutionary practice and principle. And where better to find inspiration for that sort of thing than existing socialisms? In that regard, we think socialist education in Korea uh, provides a much needed perspective. So before I turn it over to Ben uh, to actually introduce our speakers, I'd like to just mention that if you haven't read the book yet, uh, you can always find a free uh, downloadable PDF on our website at iskrabooks.org. Um, and that's likewise for all of the titles that we publish, we always uh, put free PDFs out there. Uh, you can find print copies at all major online booksellers uh, and at select local radical bookstores. And be sure to follow us on social media uh, for updates on forthcoming publications. Uh, we're currently on Twitter at, at Iskra Books, and you can also find us online as Peace, Land, and Bread uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at, at PLB Magazine. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Ben. Thank you, everyone. All right, hey comrades, uh, thank you Nate for that great introduction. Uh, and thank you again to all of our organizers, speakers and attendees today for what should be a really fantastic event. Uh, I'm Ben Stonkey, I'm a PhD candidate of political ecology. I'm the editor and art director of Peace Land and Bread and one of the editors at Iskra Books. Um, so today we're joined by Riley Sung Yoon Park. Uh, Riley's a master's student in psychology at the University of Indianapolis. Their research interests center on community-based psychotherapy from an anti-imperialist, Marxist, and disability justice orientation. They co-edited Socialist Education in Korea, selected writings of Kim Il-sung, and have written other works on Korea for the Hampton Institute. Uh, Park's an organizer for the Answer Coalition and the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And since 2019, they've been a central people's leader in various movements in Indianapolis, organizing around reproductive justice, the war on Black America, capitalism, and imperialism. Uh, and additionally, Park is active in the international Korean movement for peace and reunification, participating in the Global Peace Forum on Korea in 2019. And this month actually uh, was part of the first U.S. delegation to visit Chongryon, the General Association of Koreans in Japan, uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Uh, we also have Cambria York, the other co-editor of Socialist Education in Korea. Uh, Cambria York is a self-described uh, recovering academic. Uh, a voice actor, folklore-inspired musician, theatrical technician, and tribal sovereignty advocate. She's the editor of Socialist Education in Korea, Selected Writings of Kim Il-sung, uh, York's an organizer with the PSL, the Answer Coalition, and the Indianapolis Liberation Center, where she coordinates the People's Power Urban Farm in coalition with area mutual aid groups to combat food apartheid. Uh, and environmental racism, and as a vehicle to educate her community and demand land reform for the people, not the banks. Uh, York was born and raised in central Gulf Coast subregion of the Deep South and left the, for the Midwest to pursue a master's degree in historical and cultural musicology, but quickly became disillusioned through the sheer amount of anti-communist historical revisionist narratives which continue to run roughshod over what anti-imperialist perspective exists still in music scholarship. Uh, it was this turning point which pushed York to continue her studies independently and internationally as part of the movement. 
Uh, York is a journeyman technician in her trade union, the International Alliance of Theatrical uh, Stage Employees, and has been active in the performing arts, whether on stage or backstage, all of her life. Uh, as a voiceover artist, you can hear Cambria on the upcoming audiobook launch of Socialist Reconstruction, A Better Future for the United States, and on Liberation Audio uh, on most streaming platforms, where she regularly contributes in recording articles published through Liberation School and Liberation News to provide greater accessibility and availability of geopolitical news, theory, and analysis from a working class internationalist and Leninist lens. Uh, we also have Derek R. Ford. Uh, Derek is a teacher, an educational theorist, uh, and an organizer currently serving as Associate Professor of Education Studies at DePauw University. Uh, Ford has published eight monographs, including Encountering Education, Elements for a Marxist Pedagogy, which we had the honor to release through ISCRA in 2022 this year, and Marxism, Pedagogy, and the General Intellect, Beyond the Knowledge Economy in 2021. And we also have an upcoming book of Derek's coming out, which should be coming out by the end of the year or very early next year. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, Ford organized the latest uh, U.S. delegation to the DPRK, or the last DPRK delegation to the DPRK before the U.S. imposed travel ban, and together with Kiel Chung and Curry Malat, leads the only U.S. academic exchange program with Korea University in Japan. Uh, we also have Keith Bennett. Uh, Keith is an active member of the International Manifesto Group and a, consul uh, a consultant specializing in Chinese and Korean affairs. He's the deputy chair of the Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il Foundation, and the deputy secretary of the European Regional Society for the Study of the Juche Idea. He has closely followed events in Korea and the Korean road to socialism for nearly half a century and first visited the DPRK in 1983 as a delegate to the World Conference of Journalists Against Imperialism. Uh, he has subsequently visited the country on some 50 occasions and was twice awarded uh, the DPRK Order of Friendship by President Kim Il-sung. He's delivered papers on the Juche idea and on Korean uh, reunification at conferences in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, we also have Betsy Yoon. Uh, Betsy works as a librarian at Baruch College, uh, CUNY, and is a member of Nodatal for Korean Community Development. Betsy has coordinated, uh, coordinated Nodatal's Korea Education and Exposure Program, or KEEP, since 2011, which takes members uh, of the Korean diaspora to visit the northern and southern halves of their homeland. Uh, as part of KEEP, Betsy has led three delegations of Koreans to North Korea. Their visits to North Korea have been suspended, unfortunately, because of the ban on travel to the North that was instituted by Trump in 2017. Uh, Betsy is part of Nodatal's Tongol Solidarity Committee, which is currently working to get the ban on travel to North Korea lifted so that they can resume their delegation trips to the North. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have our wonderful moderator, Radhika Desai. Uh, Radhika is a professor at the Department of Political Studies and director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, she's the author of Geopolitical Economy After U.S. Hegemony, Globalization and Empire in 2013, also of uh, Slouching Towards Ayodhya, From Congress to Hindutva and Indian Politics in 2004, uh, and Intellectuals and Socialism, Social Democrats and the Labor Party, 1994. A New Statesman and Society Book of the Month, uh, an editor or co-editor of Russia, Ukraine, and Contemporary Imperialism, a uh, special issue of international critical thought, uh, theoretical engagements in, in geopolitical economy, analytical gains from geopolitical economy, revitalizing Marxist theory for today's capitalism, and developmental and cultural nationalisms. So very prolific. All right. So once again, just you know, thank you so much from our end, from Iskra Books. We're really excited for this event. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to the speakers to do the real heavy lifting of the event here, uh, either back to, uh, back to Radica or to Riley. Sure. Uh, let me uh, just say, uh, yeah. Uh, so Riley and Cambria, please take it away. Hey, great. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I want to give uh, my sincerest gratitude to everyone who had made this book possible. Um, extra thanks to my comrades from Peace, Land, and Bread, uh, Norutol, and uh, my comrades here um, in the PSL in Indianapolis. So we couldn't have done this without all of you. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to center my reflections around Tujang. Uh, Tujang is a phrase that translates to struggle. And it's a phrase that uh, originating from the labor movement in South Korea 
fighting uh, back against exploitive labor conditions and the US backed dictatorship that created these conditions. Uh, this term has also been used as a rallying cry uh, for the broader international Korean movement for peace and reunification. Uh, as we know, the current uh, geopolitical conditions are changing. We are now moving towards a shift towards multipolarity, and many are rejecting the vice grip hold of the US, of US hegemony. In addition, here in the United States, we are also witnessing a shift. Um, more and more pe working people are becoming more conscious and organized in the face of right-wing ruling class attempts of restricting basic democratic rights from voting rights to reproductive health access. It is important uh, now more than ever uh, to be organized and commit towards revolutionary socialism. Uh, but with that comes uh, intense political education. Uh, political education is one of the backbones um, of any revolutionary party or organization. No successful socialist revolution and nation have come to be without political education. Without it, uh, potential revolutions can fizzle out or be severely crushed by the ruling class if we do not operate strategically or covertly, um, and if we don't understand our material conditions. Uh, as Kim Il uh, Chairman Kim Il-sung said, quote, both in revolutionary struggle and in construction work, we, we should firmly adhere to the Marxist-Leninist principles applying them in a creative manner to suit the specific conditions of our country and our national characteristics. If we mechanically apply uh, for, uh, foreign experience disregarding the history of our country and the traditions of our people, and without taking an account of our own realities and level of preparedness of our people, dogmatic errors will result and much harm will be done to the revolutionary cause. To do so, fidelity to the Marxist-Leninism nor to internationalism, it runs counter to them. Marxist-Leninism is not a dogma. It is a guide to action and a creative theory. So Marxist-Leninism can display its indestructible vitality only when it's applied creatively to suit the specific conditions of each country. The same applies to the experience of the fraternal parties. It will prove valuable to us only when we make study of it, grasp its essence, and properly apply it to our realities. Instead, if we just gulp it down and spoil our work, it will not only harm our work, but also lead to discrediting the value experience of the fraternal parties, end quote. Um, relating back to Korea, the situation has become more and more intense as a uh, than it has been in the last 10 years. For context, the United States has ne never formally ended the Korean War, and there have been many US bases and troops stationed all across the Southern regions of Korea. Uh, the 2010s saw the introduction of the US's pivot to Asia policy under the direction of now former President uh, Barack Obama and former President, uh, South Korean President uh, Park Geun-hye. Um, this policy intended to primarily isolate and, and encircle China and the DPRK led to increasingly uh, led to the increasing of U.S. military troops, the consolidation of, of all U.S. operations south of the DMZ to Camp Humphreys, a massive uh, military complex in Phnom Penh, and the construction of a large naval base on Jeju Island. Uh, 2016 saw a massive people's movement calling for the impeachment of Park geun uh, the deliberate gross mismanagement that led to the Seibol uh, ferry disaster in 2014, coupled with a scandal of her administration, taking money from Chebos or conglomerates, is what, to, uh, is what led to the candlelight revolution in 2016. This policy also led to the further increased expansion of US military activity in the Pacific, in the Pacific from Chejo to Okinawa, Guam, and Hawaii, just to name a couple of places. 
um, with the election of now President Yoon Suk Yeol, uh, we are we are seeing the increasing tension on the peninsula due to the joint RLK U.S. military exercises in the south and the um, RIMPAC and exercises that were happening this past spring and continue to happen. Uh, coupled with the attempted NATO expansionism in Eastern Europe and U.S. aggression towards the DPRK, China, and Russia, the U.S. global hegemony is starting to crack and is attempting uh, is in, and is attempting to stay together. With this, the U.S.'s attempts to reconfigure its position through economic and militaristic ways. The U.S. has no right to meddle in the affairs of other countries, and certainly not in Korea. For there to be a road towards peace and reunification, the U.S. must step away from being that obstacle. As organizers and people living inside the Imperial core, the belly of the beast, we have a duty and an obligation to rise up and tear down from the beast uh, from the inside out. We cannot do it through atomized and isolated struggles, but by connecting large scale struggles that the working and nationally, nationally oppressed people face here and abroad. We must dedicate ourselves to finding the truth within, uh, the truth within mystification or the truth beyond mystification, I should say, and smash the ruling class's attempts to divide and, con and conquer the, wor the working class. For that to happen, political education organization, class analysis, and social investigation are the tools needed to smash the paper tiger, uh, in the words of uh, Chairman Mao Zedong. Um, when I was in Japan this past week, visiting the Korean schools in Chongyong, I saw what Kim Il-sung's writings fully encapsulate, encapsulates. An ironclad sense of community, dedication to one's being and education, and the commitment towards personal growth and responsibility, even in the face of continued discrimination and exclusion from the Japanese government. These are all lessons that we should be taking and learning as we move forward to the future. The road is long and hard, and there will be great times of great hardship. However, the struggle lives uh, around the world. The spirit of Tujang lives inside all of us. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Um, sorry, one second, please. Yes, Gambria, please go ahead. It's your turn. Mado, thank you for having us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. You'll have our utmost gratitude and thanks. Um, and I'd like to begin. Kim Il-sung in Theses on Socialist Education wrote that compulsory education can only become a reality when it is free. The fundamental distinction between the compulsory education in socialist societies and the so-called compulsory education in capitalist society lies in the fact that education costs are borne by the socialist state which actually provides the people with the right and freedom to study. And I just wanted to focus in on those two words, the right and freedom to study. And in the process of editing this selection, I was particularly taken by the verbiage of education being a right and a freedom guaranteed to the people. And in the US and indeed the capitalist world writ large, we are bombarded with all kinds of talk about what alleged freedoms we have. But to paraphrase a particularly famous Georgian Marxist who requires no introduction, what freedom or liberty does a homeless, jobless person have in the capitalist world? Only when exploitation, oppression, unemployment, and abject poverty have been abolished can liberty, both personal and collective, exist in reality and not just on paper. <clears throat> Excuse me. This framework of not just adequate, but high quality educational infrastructure being a human right is one that we as organizers share and practice. To build on what my comrade Riley said, national liberation, the socialist transformation of a society and its development hinges upon the ability and capacity for massive, mobilized and intensive education efforts one that cannot be delivered via mandates, but one that's developed 
throughout society and based on meeting the needs of the people. Now, if you are a colonized person living in the U.S., there is a good probability that you live in the conditions comparable to a developing country, an internal colony, inside of a prison house of nations, following Lenin's definition of the term. Um, your schools are underfunded. They're staffed with police that don't even live in your community. And they put your children in debt to pay for their often malnutritious meals. Your water is poisoned due to contamination by a capitalist entity that violated the law either to extract resources or to avoid paying for maintenance. The hospitals in your community are understaffed and given little to no support, uh, and you can't afford a single medical emergency. Your family might have various dietary needs, but the best that your public assistance can get you is government cheese. I could be talking about Okmulgee, Oklahoma on the Muscogee Res. I could be talking about Jackson, Mississippi. I could be talking about Central Valley, California. I could even be talking about my own neighborhood in Indianapolis, and my assessment would still apply. Much like how the ruling class throws us a bone through appointing people who look like you to positions of power that ultimately prove fruitless or whitewashes your own history to sell it back to you in a bid to take the fight out of you. Capitalist education exists and acts as the vehicle to instill the dead end idea that this is the best there is. It is the only option left and to demonize anyone who tries anything else. And you don't need, you do not need eyes to see that that is a bald faced lie. And this is because the US ruling class already sees its internal colonies as a fifth column, as the enemy and over polices them like an occupying army. And if you've seen the way that the ruling class talks about the workers' democracies of the world, Cuba, the PRC, the DPRK, Vietnam, Laos, etc., you don't have to guess how they feel about you. And so it's, it's not enough to make revolutionary theory more accessible. You have to be, it must be rig rigorously organized from the ground up. And this is the analogy I'm using. It's, it must be like you are constructing a munitions factory because ultimately you are arming others and you are arming yourself for the fight that is around you and the fight that is ahead of you. And I recently reread the, the Liberation School book, Revolutionary Education, Theory and Practice for Socialist Organizers, edited by comrade Nino Brown of the PSL. And Marx and Engels said it best, I think, about presuming the competence of working people. By that I mean, despite the system setting each of us up for poverty in a lifetime of wage labor, we should assume by default that those we are organizing alongside have the capacity and potential for radically transforming their understanding of the world, their consciousness, political beliefs, and commitments. Knowledge will vary, of course, but knowledge does not equate intellect or skill. This presumption of, of competence is key for socialist pedagogy because, as Paulo Freire outlined in his critical works, a reciprocal and dialogic dynamic not only helps social not only helps identify social contradictions and transform them, but equally as important to utilize and develop the wealth of intellectual curiosity and creativity that is so often crushed in most people from a young age. Through building these kinds of relationships, be they mentor, mentee, facilitator, group, educator, student, or even peer-to-peer, -peer, we model to others the best attributes our class has to contribute in the building of a world without, you know, a building of a world worthy of human potential. And as you may know, my educational background is in music. I was fortunate enough to attend a university with a renowned expert on Kodai method. As a tenured professor, she was educated in Budapest. Um, and the Kodai method, developed by Zoltan Kodai, was radical was a radical shift in music pedagogy. It utilized songs that working class students would identify with, folk songs in their own language. And it was not long before his method of music pedagogy was the dominant school of thought among music teachers in the Hungarian People's Republic. And so its principles were that music should be taught in a logical and sequential manner, that there should be pleasure in learning music, that both learning and teaching should be a pleasurable experience, not torturous, that the voice is the most accessible universal instrument that all humans have, 
that the musical material is taught in the context of the mother tongue folk song. All Kodai method style classes are never one by one on one. Uh, they're always taught collectively. And that has been the case since its inception. And so this method was so revolutionary for the time because Kodai correctly identified that engaging students on their level generally led to far more successful outcomes. I know we, know, we know this to be the case now. It's a matter of course. But in addition, Kodai ab, like, re wholeheartedly rejected and noted that, pr that prior methods of pedagogy and teaching music relied very much heavily upon the idea that students were a blank canvas, the tabula rasa, uh, for the instructor to fill with information. Now, that in turn did not take into account uh, prior knowledge or context a student may have, may bring to the classroom, and it further alienated the student from their own educational exchange. And the goal of the Kodai method, when taught completely and to its natural conclusion, is that it, the student should not only comprehend what they have been instructed, but that they have the fully realized ability to create music of their own and to understand it better. The same is true, I would argue, with uh, explicitly political education and consciousness building. Now, I'm going to wrap up with one more quote. Uh, Marshall Kim Jong-il wrote in 1995 that even if a socialist society has been established and a firm economic and material foundations of socialism laid, people do not acquire a socialist ideology automatically. And that remains true to this day. Building a socialist consciousness is a delicate, often very protracted experience, and it's not linear whatsoever. But in involving ourselves fully in the development of our fellow workers, we are able to demonstrate the values of the new society we seek to build. And it is for this reason that the task laid before any revolutionary organization that seeks to build the party to lead their people is to actively equip our class to genuinely lead the transformation of society towards a future in where humanity has not merely survived the barbarism of imperialism and fascism and climate change, but one that has thrived in spite of everything. And this will only be accomplished by any means necessary. Thank you for your time. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Cambria. Uh, we now have uh, Betsy. Betsy Yoon, please go ahead. Hi, thanks everyone for coming. And um, thank you to Riley and Cambria for putting this book together, to Iskra Publishers for publishing, and to the International Manifesto Group for hosting this webinar. Um, you may recall from the bio that Ben read of me that I am currently employed in the field of higher education. And um, so I just like to share that reading this book in the context of where I work um, and my employment really highlights the different purposes that education serves under capitalism and under socialism. Um, in the text, Kim Il-sung wrote that the purpose of education is to teach people to be creative and independent beings. Um, he writes specifically, quote, socialist education, therefore, should be the process of the ideological revolution to make people revolutionary and working class, end quote. He also says that everyone has the right to be educated, and he lays out very particularly in his discussions of the thesis uh, on socialist education what structurally needs to happen in order to ensure that education serve its purpose of creating a creative and independent populace who are responsible for carrying out the revolution. Um, contrast this with the billions of dollars that are poured into understanding how and why the education system in the U.S. is failing so many people. There's study after study being like, why doesn't this work? Why doesn't that work? Why are these outcomes bad? Why, why are, you know, why isn't it not living up to the ideal of like what education is supposed to do? Um, and not only that, there are initiatives and experiments and more initiatives that are like that are trying to trying out these little different configurations um, that are all basically devised to try to make up for the structural shortcomings of capitalist education without actually challenging any of the structural uh, shortcomings of capitalist edu education. Um, so much money is poured into all of this stuff. And um, 
Contrast all that with a student of mine last semester asking, is college a scam? Um, and it prompted very engaged discussion among the rest of the students. Students here often feel like their education is pointless or just a means to an end and are very alienated from their own learning because the education that we receive here isn't meant to serve us as human beings or society as a whole, but rather capitalist aims. Um, as seen in the text in this book, um, education, however, is not simply about learning information, absorbing facts and figures and dates. It's about one's own personal transformation into being an active part of a collective national effort of socialist revolution. In particular, Kim emphasizes that ideology is a key component and a necessary component of a rigorous and education that leads toward revolution and the sustaining of the revolution. Um, in addition, he emphasizes the need for practice and for direct experiences. At one point, he says, quote, for the students to acquire a living comprehensive knowledge of the real world, visits to revolutionary battlefields and places connected with our revolutionary history should be planned and arranged. And there should be regular visits to public, cultural, and educational establishments, factories, and other em enterprises and cooperative farms. He also states that it's vital that Koreans know Korean history and where we came from so that we know where we can go. So at this point, I'm going to transition into talking about uh, Noruto's Korea Education and Exposure Program, which is called KEEP. Um, <clears throat> first, to describe Noruto, we are diasporic Koreans and comrades organizing for a world free of imperialism and for Korea's reunification and national liberation. So KEEP began in 1994 with visits to South Korea, organized by Koreans in LA and New York. Um, the New York folks would eventually form in 99 the organization Noruto. Um, and in 2001, two years after it was formed, Noruto decided to start visiting North Korea as well, since both North and South constitute our homeland. Um, to date, North Korea has organized 11 delegation trips to North Korea, with the last one being in 2015. And as was mentioned earlier, um, this program had to be suspended because in 2017, Trump in instituted a ban on travel to North Korea for U.S. citizens. This ban is renewed on an annual basis, um, and it is completely absurd that we as Koreans, whose immigration histories are rooted in U.S. imperialist intervention in Korea, are prevented from visiting any part of our homeland. Um, and Noratol is currently working with other organizations to lift the ban on travel so that we can resume this one particular component of revolutionary education. Um, so our program takes delegations of Koreans living in the imperial core to Korea to learn directly about our revolutionary past, present, and future. Our trips, in accordance with the quote that I just shared about Kim Il-sung, visits revolutionary battlefields, places connected with revolutionary history, we visit public cultural and education establishments, factories, and other enterprises and farms. And so I'm going to share a few images from past trips that relate to themes that were raised in this text. Um, just give me a second to share my screen. One sec. Okay, so so it's just a series of images and I'll just sort of narrate as I go through the photos. Um, so first, Juche is mentioned in the text and Juche is described as a critical way of creatively and independently developing solutions that are specific to one's conditions. So this is the tower of the Juche idea. Um, and I just wanna share this image as a framing for, for the rest of the images that follow. So here, this is the children's palace. Um, all these pictures were taken by us. So I think there's better photos out there that show the whole building. Um, this only shows half of it, but you'll notice the one side is curved around and there's another similar curve on the other side. And it's meant to be, it's meant to depict arms that are embracing the children that go there. So children's palace is after school education, for students who want to continue developing this or that aspect of, of themselves. Um, so 
there's many different rooms. It's not just one type of education. The students can choose depending on their particular interests. Here, students are learning to play, practicing um, a game. Sorry, I forget its name, it excuse me. Um, in another room, there are students who are developing their athletic uh, you know, interests. Um, there's many other rooms. I'm not gonna show all the pictures, but just as one aspect of educating, making sure an emphasis in the book that I really appreciated was the emphasis on how important the children are. And you know, here in the US, um, children are treated like an afterthought as, as, as beings who need to be disciplined and like incorporated into the capitalist mentality. And I feel like the children's palace is one great example of, and this is the children's palace, the proper name, but there's lots of children's palaces in other regions that are smaller. This is just the main one, um, in Pyongyang, um, but just sort of highlights the importance of cultivating the next generation. Um, to follow in the revolutionary footsteps. This is a shot of a subway station. And I wanted to show this because you'll see here, um, these are newspapers that are, every day they put up the day's newspapers so that people who are commuting to and from work while they're waiting for the train, they can read the news without having to buy a newspaper or, or go out of their way to stay up to date on what's happening. Um, and in the text, um, Kim Il-sung referenced Kim Chek University. So we, in 2009, I believe, was the year we visited with students from Kim Chek University. Um, so they're, they're coming out here and, um, and we got a tour of their facilities, uh, including um, their computers and the different kinds of classes that they're learning. And, it's important to note that the technology that they have access to is um, often limited by sanctions. So a lot of the computers and things that we saw were not cutting edge and not modern because sanctions restricts what they have access to. Um, despite that, they, are, they have cultivated and created spaces in which learning is prioritized and valued. Um, we also visited the uh, Grand, oh shoot, I'm sorry, I forget the name. Grand People Study House, I believe. Um, and it's a library and also a study situation. So we got to see the sign here says that all books must be returned by 5.30. Um, and they demonstrated uh, for us checking books out. Um, it looks like someone was reading dining rooms and kitchens, designing areas for small spaces. There's a bunch of other, other books. And then this is also the Grand People Study House, uh, which is, uh, these were all um, adult learners who had been given leave from their work to develop one or another part of their education. So this also reflects the, and this was, you know, the text that we read was written in, 70, in the 70s. This was in 2011. And, you know, the commitment to both um, early education for children and to ongoing adult education is still a strong strain um, a strong commitment in, in the places that we visited. Um, and so we're going to transition into a couple slides that I'm going to show you are going to talk, look at the, um, Juche as it manifests in society and the very material ways in which Juche is expressed and practiced. So, um, in this shot, you'll see some folks I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's some folks wearing these typically North Korean suits. Um, and I know that we saw in photos of Kim Jong-il, he was always wearing um, this type of suit as well. And this suit is made from vinylon, which is a material that can be produced um, by North Korea in North Korea without uh, the sort of sanctions restrictions. So there's a lot of fabric that they would have to either import or they aren't able to produce on their own. And to, in order to be self-sufficient, they created this vinylon fabric in order to um, have a cheap and easy access for their, uh, for other people to, to, you know, clothing. So vinylon is, is one example. The next is we visited in 2011, a steel factory that had just recently reopened. It had been closed for many years due to sanctions, but had, uh, as of the time of our visit in 2011, had recently reopened and started producing steel again. 
in this factory, they produce juche steel, which is steel that they can produce without relying on sanctioned items. So similar to vinylon, it is another uh, manifestation of how, how they practice juche in their everyday life. Um, so this is the steel factory. This is um, one of their, I'm not familiar with steel factory terms, but you know, this is the place where they melt the steel, I suppose. And then, um, and this was our delegation meeting with the factory workers. And I just want to give out a shout out to on the on the second to the left, our comrade Hyun Lee, who passed earlier this year. And this was her first trip to North Korea, and she found it extremely impactful. Um, so just wanted to share that. And then another sign of Juche, I'm sure you've all seen um, those images of the traffic controllers in North Korea who stand at the crossways and like guide traffic. Um, my first time there, I was really fascinated with these because um, one thing that we experienced a lot was short due to sanctions was frequent electrical outages. So the electricity would go out. And so the traffic controllers to me seemed like a very juche way of addressing how do we maintain the safety of our streets, guide people along without, you know, the possible dangers of like, if there's an, elect if there's an electrical shortage, the streetlights will go out and then there could be, you know, accidents and stuff like that. And so traffic controllers are, we got to meet with a group of traffic controllers in 2011. And they're a very, um, they're a component of the public safety officers and they're very, this is a very prestigious job. It's considered um, very valuable to society. Uh, so I'm just gonna scroll through there. And um, Riley mentioned Chongyeon. And when we go to North Korea, we try to meet up with the different Zainichi groups that are meeting there. There's usually at least, a, you know, at least one delegation that we can meet up with. So here we, um, our guys were able to arrange with us a meeting with a group of Chongyun students visiting from Japan. And so this was an, a, uh, not only was this trip an opportunity to engage with North Koreans and connect with that, but also to connect with our fellow diaspora Koreans who are living in Japan and share and exchange our experiences in that regard. Um, so that's this our one trip. And then I just wanted to conclude with, um, I think the other speakers, you know, emphasized the importance of education in our, in socialist revolution, in the organizing that it is our duty to conduct here in the United States. And um, so this image is just the hammer and the sickle and the pen, the pen being a, an example of um, the importance of education. So, I just wanted to share all those photos and demonstrate how a lot of the themes and ideas that were raised in these texts from the 70s are still practiced and materially visible in society today. And just another plug that we, it is really important that we be able to resume our trips to the North. Um, it is our right as Koreans to be able to go there and to also see how a society can be organized along a completely different basis um, than what we are used to here. Because it's one thing to study all these texts and know that, that this is possible. And it's another to actually go to a place where it's being practiced in one's daily life. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Betsy. Uh, we will now have um, uh, the video of Keith Bennett, who's already been introduced. So just give me a second to uh, get it going. Thank you, comrades, for the invitation to speak at this book launch. And I'd like to begin by thanking and paying tribute to ISPRA Books for their initiative and work in making available this selection of Kim Il-sung's writings and speeches on education. Along with Leica Press, who are making available the 50 or so volumes of Kim Il-sung's works, you are performing a unique and extremely valuable service for the working class movement in the imperialist countries. Kim Il-sung is without doubt one of the very greatest leaders in the entire history 
of the world communist and working class movements. And both his works and his long history of struggle and leadership constitute a veritable encyclopedia and template of revolution. Firmly grounded and developed in Korean reality, they have relevance not only to Korea, not only to the oppressed nations and peoples. They also deal with countless questions that the working and oppressed people in the imperialist heartlands also need to grapple with and master if they are to make fundamental progress. Yet even compared to the other great communist leaders, the works of Kim Il-sung, along with those of the other great Korean communist leaders, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un, remain almost unknown and even a subject of disparagement even among some of the better sections of the working class movement in our countries. Therefore, compared to what needs to be done, the magnitude of the tasks facing us, this publication may seem a modest start, but who would reasonably underestimate the importance of a small oasis in a vast expanse of desert? That oasis is a source of life. You are also inheriting and carrying forward the work done by a few in decades past. I think, for example, of the New York-based weekly Guardian newspaper's publication of the substantial volume of On Juche in Our Revolution, with an introduction by Eldridge Cleaver, reflecting the Black Panther Party's own not inconsiderable efforts to study and disseminate the Juche idea. This Guardian newspaper, needless to say, was no relation to the British newspaper of the same name. It was a very fine socialist newspaper. Here in London, works of Kim Il-sung were published by progressive publishing houses of the African diaspora. And the International Marxist Group once published a set of his interviews with foreign journalists after the Daily Mirror had refused to accept them as paid advertisements. In the 1980s, Mosquito Press, political and publishing venture that would We can't hear the video, Radhika. Work from nurseries and kindergartens through to Kim Il-sung University after the Daily Mirror had refused to accept them as paid advertisements. In the 1980s, Mosquito Press, a political and publishing venture with which I was closely associated, published a number of works of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Education, the topic you chose for your volume, is one of the great achievements of the Socialist Democratic People's Republic of Korea, something I have been privileged to witness in the course of my numerous visits over the last nearly 40 years, where I have been able to see something of the country's educational system at work from nurseries and kindergartens through to Kim Il-sung University. Of course, this system from the lowest to the highest levels is also completely free, including in the provision of textbooks and uniforms in strong contrast to both the United States and Britain. Today, the DPRK has 12 year universal compulsory education, one of the highest in the world. Having long since reached 11 years, it was increased to 12 years in 2012 on the proposal of Comrade Kim Jong-un. Interestingly, Comrade Kim Il-sung stresses on several occasions that education can only be meaningfully compulsory when it is free. But the picture was very different when Korea achieved its liberation from Japanese colonial rule in 1945. The country barely had a handful of graduates. Yet, in a situation where so many deeds try out to be done, and always urgently, to take a line from Mao Zedong's poetry, where everything had to be started from scratch, Kim Il-sung ensured that the very first factory to be built was one to produce pencils so as to effectively promote the literacy drive and the education of the rising generation. To give another telling example, the Workers' Party of Korea is unique among the parties of the international working class movement in that its symbol and flag, feature not just the hammer and sickle, 
but also a writing branch to represent the intellectuals. The kind of disparagement or denigration of intellectuals that has occasionally featured in ultra-left detours in the great project of building socialism has never found a place in the DPRK. Rather, Kim Il-sung and the Workers' Party of Korea have advanced the dialectical formulation of both working classizing and intellectualizing the whole of society. It is on this basis that the DPRK has long advanced the ambition to progress towards universal compulsory higher education with the main form to place emphasis on work study programs as part of the move to eliminate the distinction between mental and physical labor. It is also this approach, incidentally, that enabled Kim Jong-il back in the 1980s to analyze that the increase in the number of intellectuals and those engaged in mental labor in the advanced capitalist countries did not mean that the ranks of the working people in those societies had decreased, but rather had actually increased. This dialectical approach, as little known as it is, has in many respects placed the DPRK in the forefront of the most advanced and progressive contemporary pedagogy, be it in terms of lifelong learning, distance learning, the combining of work and study, vocational education, after-school clubs, and other types of extracurricular and extramural activities, and so on. A great example is Kim Il-sung's insistence that every child should learn to play at least one musical instrument, master at least one foreign language, and excel in at least one sport. In all this, a great role is played in the after-school activities offered by the country's network of children's palaces. Of course, most socialist countries have set up similar facilities, but only in the DPRK do we find actual examples of veritable palaces, befitting Kim Il-sung's off-stated remark that children are the kings in our country. The Children's Palace in central Pyongyang was the tallest building in the capital city when it was built in 1958, marking the 10th anniversary of the founding of the DPRK. Of course, it has long since been eclipsed by numerous other buildings in the city, and not least by the Mang Day School Children's Palace, built at the foot of the newly built Pongbok Street when Korea hosted the 13th World Festival of Youth and Students in 1989. It was here that President Kim Il-sung spent the New Year holiday enjoying the children's concert until the last year of his life. I visited this palace numerous times and it offers literally hundreds of activities according to children's interests and aptitudes, from embroidery to taekwondo, from ballet to car mechanics, from table tennis to calligraphy, and yes, how to strip down and reassemble a machine gun at speed. In a word, it offers the type and range of facilities and activities only available to the children of the rich in capitalist countries, but definitely with socialist characteristics. Another example of education for all is the Grand People's Study House, situated on Kim Il-sung Square and built on the occasion of the president's 70th birthday in April 1982. As a national library freely accessible to all working people, and with millions of books. It also has its own large in-house academic staff to answer readers and researchers' questions and help them with their work and interests. You might say it is easier to see a professor in Pyongyang than it is to see a doctor in London. I want to close with two brief quotations from Kim Il-sung's thesis on socialist education, which really forms the centerpiece of the book we are discussing today. I've chosen the first for its refutation of the anti-communist and frankly racist trope that would have people believe that the Korean people are somehow brainwashed automatons subject to brutal diktat rather than citizens of a people-centered socialist society dedicated to unleashing the creativity of every person so that they might be enabled to play their full part in the building of a new society. Kim Il-sung wrote, in order to develop the student's ability to think, there should be a great deal of discussion and debate, and question and answer sessions should be conducted. The introduction of this method will enable the students 
to gain an extensive and profound understanding of what they are taught. The ideological education of students should be conducted through explanation and persuasion. It is only when the students themselves understand and accept communist ideology that it can become a firm belief. Therefore, ideological education should be neither coercive nor even crammed, but always conducted by explanation and persuasion so that the students understand and sympathize with advanced ideas of their own accord. My second and final quotation is chosen for two reasons. First, for its debunking of the calumny that the Korean Revolution is somehow based on narrow nationalism or even chauvinism. And secondly, because it is just simply inspiring. Students should be armed with proletarian internationalism. All our students should be educated to offer active support for the revolutionary struggle of the peoples of the world for peace, democracy, national independence and socialism to strengthen friendship and solidarity with them, and to fight staunchly for victory in the world revolution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks uh, everyone, and sorry about that miss, uh, that interruption there, but I think we got all of uh, Keith's talk. So now we go to our final speaker, which will be Derek Ford. Derek, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, uh, Radhika. Thank you, everybody, for uh, organizing this. And of course, uh, to Riley and Cambria for editing and uh, everybody at ISCRA for pu putting this out. Um, so the um, in March of 2020, which was just when the, the United, we in the United States were beginning some kind of quote unquote lockdown for COVID, um, the 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 Japanese government was distributing uh, protective equipment to all the schools in Japan, uh, of which there are Japanese schools and then there's a series of private schools and there's very different schools for uh, nationals, Chinese schools and uh, there's American schools and there's also Korean schools. And every single school received, uh, you know, face masks, for example, except for the Korean schools. And it was only after really a protracted struggle involving, including, involving uh, you know, international groups, including the United Nations, that uh, the Korean students in Japan were able to get face masks, right? I mean, the most sort of basic elemental, right, uh, protective equipment during that time. And I think that, like, in order to understand the sort of like really disgusting nature of how something so basic could be uh, provided to everybody except this one group, right? This one ethnic group. Um, it's it's important precisely to understand the role that education plays in uh, you know in the human project, in in uh, the socialist project, and the you know uh, the national liberation, the anti-colonial projects. And so we uh, actually yes, we just returned yesterday, about twenty four hours ago, or actually about twelve hours ago, we returned from the uh, first. U.S. academic peace delegation to visit the, the Koreans in Japan. Uh, the first time that we've been able to go since before the pandemic. And uh, the, the two years prior to the pandemic, we had organized uh, official academic exchanges between my university, DePaul University, and Korea University, which is a university affiliated with Chongyun, uh, the General Association of Korean Residents in Japan. Uh, and each time was really an incredible experience, an educational experience through education, um, about education. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about that because it's one thing to look to, you know, read the words of Kim Il-sung from 1977. Um, and then another, another to sort of think about how they play out in a sort of related, but, you know, quite different context, um, you know, 50 years later, 40 years later. And, but to do that, it's sort of, you know, the, the situation of Koreans in Japan and the role of education there, uh, you know, is unknown to so many people. And so just a couple of sort of remarks to, to, to situate this, this particular educational project, this project of socialist and also anti-colonial education. Um, there are uh, many reasons that Koreans live in Japan today, but primarily it's the result of Japanese colonialism 
through which most Koreans were really forced to go to Japan, either because their land was taken from them through Japanese colonial rule, um, or they were brought over as uh, forced slave laborers, including uh, sexual slave laborers. And um, really between in the first half of the 20th century, there were millions of Koreans living in Japan, uh, really building Japan, uh, its infrastructure, right? Uh, working in the mines, building the roads, building the, the railways, the dams, and so on and so forth. And uh, they, even though they were colonial subjects, and just as the Koreans in Korea in the peninsula were subjected to the you know, most brutal racist colonial practices that are just common for colonialism, uh, the deprivation of the cult, their culture, right, being forced to change, take on Japanese names, and so on and so forth that also happened in Japan, although they did have Japanese citizenship, uh, which is somewhat unique. When the Japanese empire was defeated in 1945, the situation on the peninsula, of course, was quite unstable. About 90% of the Koreans in Japan came from what is now you know, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, because that's the closest sort of geographically to Japan. And there was a period of uncertainty and then when the Korean War broke out, uh, the US war against Korea broke out between 1950 and 1953, um, it's sort of, although nobody accepted that the division of the peninsula would be permanent, there was this sort of need to uh, reclaim Korean culture to begin teaching children, right? Uh, Korean language, Korean dance, Korean history. And so it was uh, the initiative of Koreans in Japan with the support of the governments in the north uh, that they were able to build literally hundreds of schools uh, throughout the islands. Um, and they were viciously attacked by the Japanese governments, although in the 1950s, there was a sort of uh, agreement reached that there would be some uh, capacity for the institutions to, to, to remain sort of stable. Uh, and those schools still exist today. And the, the attack that I spoke about a couple of minutes ago is precisely you know, part of this ongoing struggle um, that they face. The, um, the schools are relatively autonomous from Japanese control because they aren't technically schools. They're considered, they're considered miscellaneous schools. Um, and there's about, today there's about 10,000 students in primary and secondary schools. Um, and many of them actually hold uh, DPRK citizenship because in the early 1950s, Koreans in Japan were, were deprived of Japanese citizenship. Uh, so they were literally stateless. And, and most chose to affiliate with North because of course in the North, Koreans were in control. And in the South, it was merely a continuation of Japanese colonial rule uh, through US colonialism. And um, amidst the various struggles to and attempts to, to shut down the schools, um, one of the really main, main ways that they went about attacking them was through uh, depriving them of the, uh, depriving students and parents the ability of using tuition dollars and what's the sort of tuition program that the Japanese government provides uh, to Korean schools. And so in 2010, um, Korean schools were exempted from the, the sort of free tuition program that the government offers. And again, these are the only schools that are exempt from that. So as a result, the schooling is very expensive. Uh, or it's, I mean, it's expensive, right? It actually costs money, even though Koreans in Japan, of course, pay, uh, pay taxes. And on Friday, we testified to a subcommittee in the, in the Japanese parliament about these schools. I'm a professor, I'm a professor of education, so I, I study education, I teach education. There was another education professor there who teaches teachers as well. And, uh, you know, our real, our point was, you know, when you visit these schools, when we take students to these schools, um, we really see that actually, despite the intense repression and the limit, limited resources that they have, that they're actually like the schools, they provide a model for what we in the United States would fight for, right? And not just socialists, but really all progressive people. Right? I mean, can you imagine if in the United States, we had schools, uh, you know, that were specifically for the education of all oppressed nationalities, particular oppressed nationalities and particular oppressed identities. And that's precisely what they're carrying on excuse me, um, to this day. And when you go into the schools, the um, I mean, uh, the, the first thing you notice is that they they always talk about our schools, right? The, the teachers talk about our schools, the principals 
the staff, and also the students. They, they say these are our schools, which is something that's really so foreign to so many of us in capitalist countries. The idea that I would I would say, oh yes, this is my school. This, these are our schools rather than, you know, this is like, the, this is just the school I go to, right? As if there was, because there's always some antagonism between the students and teachers or the students and the administrators. Uh, but with our, the, our schools, with the Korean schools in Japan, there really isn't that, that antagonism. And the reason there isn't that antagonism is not because there's some kind of oppression and there's some kind of, you know, like military rule in the schools. And in fact, it's really quite the opposite. Um, the first time that I ever visited one of the schools in, uh, in Japan, it was an elementary, it was the first Tokyo elementary middle school. Uh, which was one of the very first schools that they built. And they built them, by the way, with their own hands, all right, um, with their own own labor. Right? It's completely volunteer. The entire community, like, physically built these schools. Uh, I was asked, you know, what my impressions were by the principal. And uh, not being fluent in Korean, you know, I had a translator, Ram Moon, Moon Sung, who's a professor at Korean University. And so I, I thought I would compare it to schools in the United States. And I began and I said, well, you know, in the United States, many people compare schools to prisons. And in fact, there's a whole literature about schools as prisons and schools as, you know, preparation for prison. And uh, the, uh, Dr. Moon, Dr. Gum looked at me, you know, looked around and, and was like at a total loss for words. And eventually, uh, Professor Chung, who wasn't able to make it today, he stepped in with the translation. And uh, later on, uh, Dr. Ram told me, said, you know, I, I'm very sorry I wasn't able to translate that, but what you said made no sense to me, right? And I, I couldn't, I couldn't really comprehend it in English, let alone translate it into Korean, right? Because the idea that schools would be something like prison is just so foreign, such, such a foreign concept that it was literally, there literally wasn't language for them to, to, to articulate it as such because they're really just such precisely the opposite of prisons. Even though there's such a, there's, there's looking, at the, looking at it from an outsider's perspective, one might uh, think that there is some, you know, sort of like di uh, disciplinary apparatus within the schools. I mean, when you go in there, no students are on their cell phones. You know, there's very little like crosstalk between students. The respect that teachers and students have for each other is, you know, it's, it's, it's on display. Um, there's a lot of joking around, right? There's a lot of laughter taking place. There's like genuine happiness, right? Um, and there's a lot of spontaneity that's involved in the classroom. Uh, you know, people are sort of talking over each other in discussions and critical conversations with each other. Uh, so it's really precisely the opposite, you know, of, of anything like a prison. And that's why they refer to them as our schools. And that's why the, uh, the, gov the Japanese government and imperialism wants to attack um, not just the political ideology, right, for socialist education, but also its connection to the National Liberation Project, right, because those two things are not antagonistic. The struggle for national liberation and the struggle for socialism are not contradictory. Uh, in, you know, in our age, they are uh, actually, uh, you know, they go together, they must necessarily go together. And that's a struggle that they're carrying on today. And so we can really see, I think, the, uh, the, the theses on socialist education play out in, in this particular context. Um, and the power of the theses and the ideas put forward, the pedagogical theories and philosophies, as well as the recommendations for institutional practices and the particular organization of the schools, uh, we can see them carrying on to, carried on today, even in the face of immense repression by the government and by racist right-wing groups that will protest outside the schools, calling the students cockroaches and, and slashing their, their clothing such that uh, the students often have to change their clothes when they go into school because if they, if they, uh, if they wear their traditional clothing on the subways, for example, uh, you know, right-wingers will attack them, will slash the clothing. Um, so under that kind of repression, they're still able to, to, to maintain this uh, to maintain not only these our schools and the educational institutions, but also the struggle, you know, the, the Korean identity, the Korean language, um, and various uh, Korean cultural traditions, um, as well as, of course, the sort of political project. And so I think it's just a, a very important uh, to, to demonstrate the not only the theses on social education and how they play out, but also really the central role that education plays in the Korean struggle in terms of keeping the Korean diaspora uh, uh, connected uh, and the Korean National Liberation Project going. 
And also in terms of the broader anti-imperialist and the broader socialist project, education is not just being, in other words, a subset of the socialist project or the socialist struggle, but actually sort of one of the key ingredients and the key uh, elements that links uh, the various uh, con constitutive factors in, in those struggles together. Thanks. Lovely, thank you so much, Derek. We can now move to the question and answer session. Um, so if uh, what we'd like to do is if you would like to make a comment or raise a question for any of the panelists who are here, uh, please use the raise hand function, which is uh, in my screen, it's, it should be somewhere at the bottom of your screen, either as an independent raise hand function or under reactions. So please uh, use that. Otherwise, I may not be able to see you since um, if you simply raise hand like this, I may not be able to see you. So uh, please do use that function. And while you're thinking about your questions, may I please ask Alan Freeman to say a couple of words about the International Manifesto Group. So Alan, please go ahead. I'm going to share a screen, which I hope will work. And um, what you have there is the website of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, where you can see this seminar advertised uh, right at the top. And in a way, that, that, that indicates what it is that we in the International Manifesto Group exist to do. We, we exist to promote the support of groups like yourselves and to create the widest possible platform for discussion on the basis of a document which we issued uh, just over a year ago um, called the International Manifesto, and that's available on another website that I'll direct you to shortly. To give you some idea of the range of things that we've covered, I'm just showing you a page with the videos that with the webinars we've recently hosted. So there's this one, there's the far right in Italy, the situation in Brazil, the, um, the Congress of the Americas and the, you know, the catastrophic uh, situation of the way that, that the Monroe Doctrine is compelling the United States to act, the conflict in Ukraine. And if you go down of socialist states and the environment, inflation, you'll see along here, I hope you can see this, um, 15 pages of these. And that's what we've done in a year. So why do we do that? Because uh, we, in a sense, in, in in line with the topics that people have been discussing, we have to create a, a self-reliant community of people who are collaborating for a different world and a different perspective on it. Well, how can, you, how can we help each other? Let me put it that way. Well, the first and most obvious thing is that we must promote what each other are doing. So I'm just gonna shamelessly introduce you to the, some of the things that I hope you, you will help us promote. And I'll, I'll stop sharing at this point, but what I'll do is copy into the um, chat a series of, a series of uh, web pages, which I hope you'll uh, visit. And I'll just talk you briefly through them. This first one is the one we just visited. That's where you'll see all the videos. Here is uh, where you can give us money. Now that's rather important. We are a self-supporting group. We've, we've uh, set our, hearts against either going and looking for a big funder or taking advertising or doing sort of collectivism, you know, just carrying everything. We are very selective in what we carry. Um, and therefore, um, it's very important to understand that we cannot function without money. And it's a very simple thing you can do is just give us a regular donation. If we get 200 people giving us $10 a month, 500 people giving us $3 a month, that will enable us to keep going. It's not very difficult to do. Then you will see our YouTube channel, and that's where you'll see our videos. What do we hope you'll do? We hope you'll share them. We hope you'll like them. We hope you'll subscribe to the channel. That all pushes them up the ratings when people visit YouTube, and it means people who have not yet seen what we have to say, like this, will see it. Then um, you can see a sample of the videos that we have by visiting next one and finally we do have a website called new cold war which is a news and analysis site and we have regularly every day updates from across the world of the left if you would like to share what you see there on social media if you'd like to share that that's that's going to greatly help boost what we're doing 
And um, the last thing you can do is sign the manifesto. If you sign the manifesto, you increase the number of people that are recognized as supporting us. And also you will receive me emails about, for example, educational projects that we have that are specific for signatories of the manifesto. So with that, thank you very much. Over to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Alan. So I see there are two hands up already and hopefully there'll be more. So we'll take those two questions and then go to the panel and then see if there are any further comments and questions. I see three, that's excellent. So I think we'll take those three. So Carlos, Ian, and then Arnold in that order. Thanks a lot, Radhika. Um, yeah, I just, you know, really, really interesting session so far. And I, I thought there was a really insightful point as I was reading the book. Um, which I which I only read on Friday and yesterday, in Derek Ford's introduction, where you know he says studying socialist education in Korea is no more weird than studying education in Finland, which is what a lot of people do, right? You know, it's a very popular subject within education studies because the Finnish have developed this very effective means of of educating in people in what might broadly be considered to be. Um, you know, Western capitalist values. Of course, they don't put it like that because when does the capitalist class ever make it clear um, um, that there's a class basis to everything they do? But you know, what we—that's what we have in the West, right? We've got capitalist education, an education system that acculturates people to a society based on a certain set of values, which normalizes inequality, that idolizes individualism and which justifies the consolidation of wealth and power among a very small group of people who are incidentally overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. So education in Korea is particularly interesting because it's based on working class pedagogy, on acculturating people not to a capitalist society, but a socialist society, a society based on a profoundly different set of values, communist and anti-imperialist values, and at the same time, deeply connected to, to Korean traditions. So, you know, for that reason, and, and because of the level of demonization that the DPRK is subjected to, it's particularly um, difficult to read Kim Il-sung's writings on education with an open mind and without prejudice, but it's all the more important to do so. I guess, like, the, the DPRK is probably the country that's made the least concessions of any country in the world to imperialist cultural hegemony. And as such, it's considered the most weird, the least acceptable, the least normal. But the successes of Korean education mean that actually we're kind of duty bound to study it in a relatively poor developing country, subjected to suffocating sanctions and under permanent threat, you know, 70 year threat of nuclear annihilation. The DPRK's education system has managed to produce one of the most highly educated populations in the world. And at the same time, a highly mobilized thinking population that stands ready to defend the gains that have been made under socialism. There's, there's none of the kind of the nihilism, the pervasive nihilism that characterizes modern societies in the West. There's none of the bread and circuses approach to social control that's so core to contemporary capitalism. So I'd just like to thank the authors and the publishers of the book and all the participants today for helping to open up this extremely important discussion and for taking part in the essential work of knocking down these pervasive anti-communist and racist prejudices surrounding the DPRK. Thanks a lot. That's, uh, thanks, Carlos, very important. Um, so uh, next we have uh, Ian and then Arnold. Hi, first of all, a couple of um, apologies. I've got my camera actually on, but in the last few days, it doesn't seem to be able to work. And secondly, I came in about uh, 2.40. So if any of my points have already been uh, answered or acknowledged, uh, apologies for that. I, I would like to riff off a couple of things um, that, that stood out to me in a good way um, from uh, what Keith said. Um, he talked about uh, how about this stereotype um, that he totally um, repudiated, as would I, of um, the North Korean people as uh, simply brainwashed. And I'd agree with that. I'd extend it to, I don't think the South Korean people are simply brainwashed 
either. Um, the two thirds of uh, the Korean population who live in the south, and it was ever thus. It's not because um, the birth rate went down precipitously uh, in the north. It's just a colder, um, more northern area, and it, it's a case, a, a real test case where. Um, without either any kind of uh, gutter racist um, explanations or, or more subtle culturalist ones, two totally different societies have emerged from, from the same culture and nationality. And I don't believe that either is simply the result of brainwashing, but um, we're at an impasse now, and Keith did mention the ultra-left um, detours on the way to socialism, where simply reunifying on the basis of one accepting the other seems incredibly difficult. Now, obviously among us, maybe less obviously among the outside world, and, and it's right to make this point, the, the North was simply subsumed into the South after collapse, as happened in East Germany. You're learning today about the uh, socialist uh, sectors that, that would really be something lost, something precious that would be lost, plus obviously the the exploitation that would come after that in a much, too much less divergent economies in Germany is still a big problem uh, in, in the east of Germany today. However, it also seems to me that the uh, form of society that's built up in North Korea under intense imperialist pressure, of course, um, couldn't simply, uh, in the way that North Vietnam did after only 20 years and of constant uh, anti-imperialist war subsume the South. That would both be hugely unlikely, but also undesirable. Um, and uh, even the most confederal one country, two systems form of unification, um, if it allowed Koreans on both sides of the border, their right as Koreans to family reunification and to free movement around the peninsula, I think would undermine important centers uh, of power in both societies, because I think there is, it's, it's, I will try and get my hands on the book and read it with an open mind and see how it relates the theories in the book to the realities uh, as well as the first speaker when I came in was doing. But I think there is a downside uh, in, in North Korea. Um, looking in the uh, kind of orthodox communist canon, uh, maybe a bit old fashioned now, but I'd still uphold it, Khrushchev's speech on the cult of personality. Um, I think because uh, that's an ideological thing, but not unrelated to education, that's gone particularly uh, to a particular extent in Korea, much more than it ever even did in the USSR. Um, even Trotskyist ideas of the deformed worker state, that there's a socialist sector that's valuable, but there's also um, a bureaucracy encrusting it. And finally, the one thing on education that I was aware of Kim Il-sung writing before this webinar was building a monolithic ideological system. Um, his his um, document from 1980, I don't know if it's in the book or not, and I think that monolithism is very unhelpful in uh, eventually hopefully getting reunification, even though our job in the West obviously is to get America's boot off the neck of both Korea's so that, um, I mean, South Korea has now got a bigger economy than Russia, as we kept uh, mentioning when we were debating imperialism. If you can uh, wrap it up, please, Ian. And, uh, and it's also got a big opposition movement. Even if you watch the K-dramas, you can see there's a lot of problems in that country. They don't have an NHS. That's a big, um, that's a big plot point in a lot of the dramas. And a united Korea could be, without America even controlling its defence, could be a real contribution to pluripolarity, but it can't be on the basis simply of the North Korean regime being extended to, to the peninsula, and there'll have to be concessions made, surely. Uh, so I'd just like to see what the speakers think about all that. I know it's a bit of a complicated question. Uh, you raise some good points. I'm sure lots of people have these questions, so I'm sure the speakers will address them. So, uh, and final question in this round, uh, Arnold, and then we'll take a second round of questions later. Uh, thank you, Branica. Uh, I have a very short question, but before I have to, I would like to congratulate Iskra Books uh, for, uh, for publishing this important text, as well as, of course, the authors and IMG for organizing this uh, web. Uh, literacy is obviously a very important base 
for the educational system. So my question is to Keith, who touched on the that and anyone else, can you please tell us how the DPRK in its initial years after its founding, how it developed literacy? Okay, thank you. So I will now ask uh, the speakers to please uh, respond. Um, if you can just uh, start speaking or, or raise your hand, whatever you want to do, but whoever would like to respond to any and all of these questions so far. Hi, um, I have a quick response to Ian's question about reunification. I believe uh, all previous North-South engagements on this topic have stressed the need for an independent reunification by Korea without outside interference. And so I believe that as people living in the United States, or not all of us live in the United States, apologies to uh, those of you who are here who are not, but um, particularly for myself living in the United States, I see that um, my role and responsibility is not to uh, tell the Koreans living on the peninsula what particular type of reunification is best suited for them, but to create, to remove the US interference that is creating the conditions for a negative reunification. The, the comparison of East and West Germany was brought up and I think, the U.S. had a heavy influence in how that went through and how it was processed and was not done according to the will of the German people either. And so uh, I believe that our primary responsibility is to remove those obstacles to a just reunification, the main factor of which is U.S. imperialism on the Korean peninsula. Thank you, Betsy. Um, other people would like to respond to these questions and comments? Other speakers? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yes, I want to um, uh, echo uh, Betsy's point uh, in response to Ian's question. Um, yes, um, I, I, I believe that, you know, the like Betsy said, the primary obstacle for reunification um, on the Korean Peninsula is that of the U.S. military and of U.S. imperialism. And so what our responsibility here in the United States or to whomever else um, outside of the United States, what our responsibility is, is to, um, our responsibility is to, uh, our responsibility is to, um, again, smash uh, the, the, like I said, the paper tiger from within. Um, and so uh, it, we um, cannot, um, yeah, we cannot tell um, Koreans on the peninsula what to do in terms of um, how they, uh, in their process of reunification. The only way for reunification to happen in whatever capacity is for the United States to end its military occupation of the Southern regions of Korea. Yeah, if I could just say something about the, the question of literacy, I think, um, you know, especially in, in looking at the, um, well, of course, there's, you know, liter I mean, literacy is, you know, the ability to sort of read or listen or understand or comprehend something. So, you know, there's many ways in which all of us are illiterate and, you know, in many different areas, uh, you know, even in our own sort of worlds and our own daily lives. Uh, there's, you know, many, many names and references that we hear that we're actually just not, we don't have that sort of capacity to understand because we haven't had that education and literacy. And then when looking at the, the education in, in the Korean struggle and, and in the DPRK, uh, looking at it contrasted with, you know, other socialist projects, I think there's, you know, one thing that's, that's, uh, that's important is that the literacy was really developed in the anti-colonial, anti-Japanese, anti-US struggle uh, for decades, right? That within the movement itself, uh, there was there was literacy, there was education and literacy and the creation of literacy programs. This is what really, uh, you know, the theoretical writings that, that of, of Kim Il-sung in that period and others uh, did. And that literacy, because the, the people who were fighting and who were engaged in that struggle became the government in the North, that literacy program continued. And because the DPRK was, you know, like 
a state, right? I mean, before even the, the People's Republic of China became a state, right? The DPRK was a state. Uh, and they were able to sort of develop literacy and educational institutions in a formal way that was unlike uh, those of socialist states that followed uh, that happened much later, right? For example, like the Cuban literacy campaigns, right? Which are, you know, tremendous examples of, of the capacity of people to self-mobilize and to be mobilized, to teach each other, uh, despite age differences and rural, you know, town country differences. Uh, and so on and so forth, right, to, to call on the will of the people. Because this, it was a socialist government really from the beginning and because it was constructed uh, with, with such intentionality, right, that the model of literacy education was very different in the DPRK than that took place within, uh, within Cuba. But such a high priority in particular was given to the education of children and the children who, uh, you know, who, who lost their parents during the, the, the decades long struggle against colonialism, right, where, uh, you know, particular schools were were constructed in the north just to care for these children, uh, and it really became the entire nation's responsibility to care for these children. And you can contrast that with which, of course, with with what took place in the south under the domination of you know the U.S. Uh, colonial regime, where you know the children of those who died in in the war and in the liberation struggle were really not only not cared for, but oftentimes just sold off and created a sort of, you know as a sort of international really like, I don't know, almost like tr child traffic, child trafficking, uh, a ring that developed. Uh, whereas, you know, in the North, they were sort of given the highest priority and they were sort of put on this, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, placed very highly in the rank of priorities. I'll just say that. Um, okay, any other responses from the panelists? Yeah, I actually would like to um, read an excerpt uh, from theses on socialist education, because I feel this particular excerpt is quite relevant to the question of what was the task of education and literacy uh, during the revolution, during the war, and then afterwards. Um, so this was obviously 1977. Uh, immediately after liberation, even though our country's economy was in severe difficulties, we took measures to exempt the children of poor families from school fees and provide the students at specialized schools and universities with state grants. In the post-war years, universal compulsory primary education and universal compulsory secondary education became free. In 1959, state-financed universal free education was introduced at all the educational institutions in our country. Now we offer universal 11-year compulsory education entirely free of charge and give free education to all the children and students who study at educational institutions of all levels from kindergartens to institutions of higher learning. Not only school education, but also all forms of social education are free and adult education for cadres and working people is also given at state expense. The proportion of our budget devoted to education is very high and is increasing every year. Now, when he was talking about the development of, of cadres and continuing continuing education, I wanted to draw attention to the uh, study while you work system, which I thought was quite excellent uh, in, in terms of the fact you had like they're prioritizing the rebuilding of their country after it was leveled completely by the US Air Force and the ground forces that went in afterwards. And so how do you balance the need for rapid industrialization and rebuilding of a key infrastructure with the responsibility, the social responsibility to your people to have them be well-educated, well-rounded people. And so in talking about the study while you work system, uh, besides the regular system of education, our party has set up a system of part-time education on the principle of providing education not only for the younger generation, uh, but also for the workers, peasants, and other sections of the working people. In fact, everyone without exception has and has steadily developed it to meet our present needs. Today, the system of education takes such forms as working people's senior middle schools, factory, higher specialized schools, factory, colleges, correspondences, and evening courses and the regular system for study of study for officials and working people. And um, I think it, it speaks uh, volumes to the fact that no one is excluded from the process. And in fact, it was absolutely necessary to include as many people as possible. So that way you avoid 
the types of stratification of uh, people into intelligentsia, workers, etc., that Kim Il-sung was criticizing in part of this work. I hope that helps. Okay, um, we can, uh, unless there are any other responses, we can go to, Hi. yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I have one more thing about the literacy. Um, so when North Korea was um, working to establish 100% uh, literacy rate, they were really engaged in a process of pedagogical experimentation and they were totally willing to scrap things that weren't working they were clear in identifying when something wasn't working and then trying to move on and develop from that um and you know a lot of it the stuff that i read like really contrasts with the way with the sort of tone that pedagogy has taken on in the united states um there's just like they were just really willing to like criticize what wasn't working and then make the change based on like material conditions and then trying to figure out how do we meet the needs of these different people, workers um, who don't necessarily have the time to study uh, and like, how can we make this structural? And so I just wanted to emphasize the um, the sort of experimental, experimental nature, which stands in contrast to a lot of the ways in which we see North Korea as portrayed, which is like this rigid structure that isn't open to change. And I think like its origins and its continuing work in like changing what's working and having a vision that's rooted in a society or that's rooted in a vision of a future that they're trying to work towards is, um, is stands very much in contrast to common perceptions of North Korea. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have uh, one more question. Uh, Tuntun, please go ahead. Oh, two more questions. Excellent. Please go ahead, Tuntun, and then Brendan. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank all those panelists and um, all the organizations who put together this event and really educational. Um, so I was at the last two answers, I think, actually kind of play really well into the, the, what I was wondering a little bit. So I guess it's a little bit two prongs. Um, I was wondering a little bit, uh, as far as historically, how the development of educational structures in the DPRK, if there's anything that kind of like made it markedly different from like other experiments in like the USSR or the PRC or other socialist countries. I know that there's always kind of like talk about like, you know, um, adapting to local conditions or whatnot. So the like Koreanification of education or whatnot. I was wondering if there's more like um, concrete examples anyone would be able to speak to. And then um, and same, I was also, I guess a little unrelated, I was wondering a little bit about like, um, we were just kind of talking about how education was kind of suited to like prevent the emergence of a hierarchy between people who could and couldn't have like a timer to access education. Um, I was wondering a little bit about like the urban rural divide, how that looks in the modern day. Like if, um, so I know that, and obviously like, there's, you know, really heavy impacts of sanctions and whatnot. Um, but I was wondering a little bit, like if there's any kind of like, uh, like what education looks like in the rural areas and if that differs at all from like, you know, big cities like Pyongyang or whatnot. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks again. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Brendan. And then Evelyn Wells. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, just, yeah, I want to thank, thank the speakers and the organizers for this event. This is the important initiative. And, yeah, I'm excited to, to continue reading the book. And I guess I'm just, um, I'm curious to pick up a couple of things that were mentioned. One by Keith, um, who mentioned that <clears throat> the DPR kid sort of like anti-intellectualism that comes, that you see in like ultra-left circles never really gained purchase much in the DPRK. And um, and then similarly, like also picking up on the like the Juche idea, how important that was in the educational um, programming of the Black Pan Party, as I as I understand it. And so I just like taking those two things together. I guess I'm just kind of curious in terms of what how organizers see sort of some of the practical lessons from this volume and um, and Juche in general in terms of. Uh, pedagogy organizing in the kind of I'm thinking of the North American context today, where I, I do see a sort of anti-intellectualism that uh, has a lot of purchase that maybe you know has something to do with ultra leftism, but I think also has to do more with the sort of nihilistic outlook um, and a sort of anarchistic outlook. But also the fact that um, you know movements and, and oppressed peoples are, you know, there is an exploited dynamic that's taking place in a lot of movements between sort of intellectuals who come in to sort of like study or build a career off having these sorts of relationships with like oppressed people movements and then sort of move away. I think that like that has had a large 
impact like I've had it um, puts me, I think of like working with uh, indigenous nations in Canada and I, uh, um, uh, Peter Kulczewski, a great professor has put it, has summarized the, the attitude of sort of Canadian left. And I think it applies to activists in terms of their engagement with indigenous nations has kind of been like, they have all the problems, we have all the solutions. And it's very much reproduced this sort of hierarchical, um, um, yeah, this, this sort of hierarchical and sort of alienated process of like, of educating um, for the purposes of, you know, understanding our own kind of off mechanistic ideology and not really grounding yourself in, in learning from your own context while trying to educate as well. So I hope this sort of, this sort of makes sense. I'm curious, the, the question is like, taking all this into account, what are you, I guess, especially since I know the PSL has a great thing, great educational initiatives and they're well represented here. So I'm curious about the practical lessons that have come from both studying, editing, publishing this, this volume while also working constructively with movements. So thanks everybody. Thanks, Brendan, a uh, very good question. And then Evelyn, please go ahead. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Evelyn Wells, he, she, they pronouns. Um, I just wanna say, um, as also an organizer from PSL Indianapolis, as well as Indie Hope Packages, I wanna say great presentations from everyone this morning. Um, Words of wisdom always pass through all walks of life, including Black people's lives and all these uh, Christian workers that I've been working with. Also, a lot of community organizations that are really listening to y'all now and really understanding what y'all trying to put out in the streets. I just want to appreciate all that work that's been going on um, on the, the educational level because it's very valuable to really get this information to be connected to the people. And I really appreciate everyone today. Now, my question pertains to you know, what would be the value of the Korean struggle to, you know, everyday working people uniting in, you know, just my neighborhood, just neighborhoods across, across town in Indiana, just all these people who are, you know, striving to actually organize against the inflation that's going on, the insane gas prices, and just quite frankly, just living in a ludicrous time that no one wants to deal with. And people are starting to understand that like, oh my God, like the COVID-19 pandemic, like China just like had like almost like no deaths and just just over the past year. And so how do we get to that? Like how, what is the value of the Korean struggle to, you know, real people's movements on the ground who are really organizing everyday working people going through child care laws, going through homelessness, going through hunger, going through all these things that, you know, we, you know, as Marxist Leninists or, you know, Marxists in general should be striving to just deal with and address. That's my question. Okay, so thank, thank you, you. Evelyn. Um, uh, since I think this is the last round of questions, maybe I will stick in uh, one question that I have. Um, I know, Derek, in your introduction, you referred to this a little bit, but maybe others have something to say as well. How did you all read the strange theater of the Trump's, of Trump's summit uh, with Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, what, you know, the expectations that were raised about the possibility of reaching some sort of deal on sanctions and nuclear weapons and so on. What was really going on, according to you, what was possible and what happened? If you would please address that as well, that would be great. So um, those are the questions. And uh, as before, if uh, the speakers would like to simply uh, you know, intervene and, uh, and respond, that would be great in any order whatsoever. And I should say, if any members of the audience would like to address this as well, please raise your hand. Um, anyone, any speakers? So I think I'll, I'll quickly, I'll quickly address your question um, with regards to the, the Trump summit. I, ironically, that was one of the most geopolitically progressive things a sitting president of the U.S. has done in decades. And he was, I, don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't like any U.S. politician, but uh, the fact that he was lambasted for even attempting to 
discuss things with uh with Kim Jong Un um goes to show that the uh that ultimately ultimately what we have with the center right party that calls themselves the democrats uh they are contrarians in that you know one party is focused on one kind of imperialist aggression one party is focused on another whether it's russia or china or the dprk and and so to reject any notion of brokering uh, a ceasefire, any any notion of brokering a uh, you know a, a removal of troops and bases from the south <clears throat> uh, has been set back because of that demonization of any attempt at uh, normalized relations. And if the if the U.S. ruling class continues to choose to isolate itself in this way, then they are continuing to dig their own graves, respectfully, in terms of geopolitical relevance. Thanks, uh, Cambria. Uh, any other speakers would like to respond to this question or any of the others? There were three, four questions placed. Um, if not, I will go to Robert. I think you want to say something and then I'll give speakers a last chance to uh, to respond and then we'll bring matters to a close. We've been going for nearly two hours. So Robert, please go ahead. Thank you, Radic uh, thank you, Radic Uh I was wondering if Derek had a comment about that recent assassination in Japan. Was there any right, right wing uh, blowback? Thank you. Uh, Derek, would you like to address this in any other question, please? Yeah, I'll just say um, that, yeah, I mean, whenever there's, there's, whenever there's tension, in many ways, the Japanese government and also the U.S. really use the population of Koreans in Japan, uh, and particularly those affiliated with uh, the General Association of Korean Residents of Japan, almost as like hostages, right? Uh, where whenever there's, um, you know, increased tensions or uh, the, you know, increased sanctions, another, another model uh, is to, is to sanction ultimately the, the schools uh, and the various institutions of Koreans in Japan, because it's such an important, you know, it's really, it, it's so important to the government of the DPRK and to the Korean struggle uh, to support the Koreans in Japan and the Koreans, uh, the Korean diaspora more generally. Um, there, I mean, there was no sort of concrete, um, uh, uh, action, uh, re retaliation. Um, although, you know, historically this is, I mean, the, 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 the Chongyun headquarters, we really haven't been able to visit there. This most recent time was the first time we were able to visit there because, uh, there was a, there was a, um, really a drive, there was a drive-by shooting ultimately that took place several years ago. Um, and last, uh, a week ago from yesterday, uh, the 19th, there was a large uh, cultural gathering of Koreans uh, in Japan at Korea University. Uh, there were about 3,000 uh, Koreans from all over the, the islands that came there um, for a celebration. And the right wingers were, were driving around with their speakers, uh, again, calling you know, them cockroaches and saying, Koreans, get out. Uh, and so that kind of daily, you know, that daily repression, which, which always exists, is really just amplified uh, whenever there's uh, whenever there's an, another sort of incident that the Japanese government can use uh, as an excuse um, to to continue their discrimination, and they just and it's really quite remarkable. I mean, at the at the uh, at the par parliamentary uh, subcommittee that we were at, you know, I mean, there's just testimony after testimony about the tremendous things that these schools are doing and the, the tremendous discrimination and racism they face. And the, the you know, the, um, you know what the government's gonna say in response in advance. You know, it's like, it's like I was talking to a reporter for the Chosun Shimbo who's, and I said like, yeah, it's almost as if you can write the article before it even happens because they just say, there's no discrimination and we're just following the law, right? That's really all they say, even though the United Nations and, and basically like the international community knows that that's precisely the opposite. Um, and, the, and the other thing too, that's, uh, that's related to that is that my very first time there actually, I arrived the day uh, after the election in 2016. Um, and uh, of course there was a, a period of profound confusion and sort of disorientation uh, in the United States and, and in much of the world. But the, uh, interestingly, the, the Korean comrades there 
were, uh, were actually quite optimistic in terms of the, the issue of Korea with the Trump administration because they knew that here's somebody who's a political outsider who, you know, I mean, didn't, you know, hasn't been inaugurated in the formal institutions of uh, the, the US political establishment. And so they knew very early on that there was an opening uh, in a way that, you know, many of us in the United States or other parts of the world, other parts of the world really couldn't anticipate. So very interesting. Uh, great, uh, Derek. And I think, Betsy, you have a response. Yeah, um, I want to respond to um, Everlyn's really great question. And I think the question is sort of pointing to, um, you know, what is the material relationship between the struggle on the Korean peninsula and the everyday the daily struggles of people here mm -hmm. living within the imperial core um, and the regular oppressions that we also face. And I think um, there's a larger analysis, of course, that it's the it's imperialism that's motivating both the oppressions that are happening within the United States and elsewhere in the imperial core and the struggle that's happening in Korea. And I think um, at one point in the text, Kim Il-sung said that um, love for Korea and, and revolutionary nationalism was the same as revolutionary internationalism and love for all peoples. And so I think um, really integrating the question, really demonstrating the links between the two struggles and showing how they're not separate, I think is a task that we as organizers need to need to really delve into and figure out how to like make very materially clear and also like cultivating that sense of internationalism and and the idea that all of our struggles share a common foe and so and so organizing together so i don't know if that sort of satisfies the answer but i think the ultimate conclusion is that like this is a task that we as organizers need to um figure out how to you know maybe using some of the lessons um from from this text and also the way in which North Korea is really willing to engage in experimentation to figure out how to make things work. Like, um, I think that's like a task that we need to really dive into and that this book sort of is one component of showing us how to get there. That's really great, uh, Betsy. In fact, if there are no further interventions, I think that's a great note to end on, which in which you, I think, responded um, to Brendan's question and some of the other concerns that were raised, which is really great. And uh, so with that, may I please, uh, first of all, thank Iskra Books for publishing this. I hope very much that the IMG and Iskra Books can continue to collaborate in various ways and to bring to uh, people the wonderful books, to make further known the wonderful books that you are producing with, uh, as somebody said in the chat, the wonderful artwork that goes on the covers, etc. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the book and thanks to all the speakers who have been excellent. Uh, thanks to the audience, which has remained here in a very large number, even though we are now nearly at, well, we are over two hours. Uh, we look for, please look out for our next event, which is going to be an event we are organizing on uh, the, uh, uh, on across straight relations, that is to say relations between China and, and, and Taiwan, um, which is going to be quite interesting and in which people from the two parts of China will be taking part. So we will be circulating ad uh, advertisements about that. And uh, of course, in the new year, we hope to bring you lots of uh, new events. Uh, so with that, thank you all very much. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, please, if you haven't already familiarized yourself, please familiarize yourself with our manifesto as well and consider signing it. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.